Dear Christine, ladies and gentlemen, although I don't see so many men around, dear friends, I'm really, really very, very happy to be, to be here today, and I have to thank, thank all of you to invite me, and also I would like to, to thank uh, your board member, Lorella Zanardo, for putting us in contact. It is great, it is really great to see so many motivated, passionate women from all over the world to come together to help one another achieve more. This is, I believe it's a wonderful task, to help one another. We need to get rid of the so-called glass ceiling. And organizations like uh, WIN are playing a very important role in uh, enabling us to do so. I'm also glad that the 18th Global Wind Conference is taking place in Rome. And uh, would like also to extend my warmest welcome to you all. Italy has made uh, a lot of progress uh, in terms of uh, women, women's empowerment. And this happened during the last decades. But, of course, we still have a long way to go to ensure women find jobs, keep those jobs when they have children, and earn as much as their male colleagues. Because this is not the case yet, unfortunately. And also, a lot must be done to combat domestic violence and the sexism, which is still rampant in public uh, discourse and in the way women are depicted by the media. So let me begin, let me begin by, by telling you a little about myself. I grew up in a small city, in a small, actually in a town, in the hills uh, of uh, central Italy, in a large family, in a large family, I was the, the eldest daughter. We were five. And despite uh, the rather traditional contest uh, I grew up in, from a uh, very early age, I have to say, I tended to dispute my eldest's authority and the way things worked in my family. Why were my sister and I asked to lay the table Why? Our brothers played. What was the reason of this? <laughs> there was not a real reason. I couldn't understand why the difference. And why were we the only ones clearing up after the meals? So these were the questions for me and my sister. And we decided to go on strike. <laughs> I tell you the truth. We went on strike. At the end of my mother, five children, she was a teacher, she was desperate. She realized she couldn't ignore our request. And at the end, we won. Other bro our brothers were with us to do what it was necessary at home to do. Now, um, of course, they still hold it against me. <laughs> but I think, I think that at the end, they are also grateful. Their wives are grateful. <laughs> yes, they indeed are grateful. You know, because they grew up with the idea that it was normal. It was normal to share work at home. It was absolutely normal to take care of our, you know, younger children, younger brothers who were there. It was not only my task. And, uh, and too often, when we talk about women's empowerment uh, and gender equality, we forget about the men. We can't forget about the men. They have to be part of our programs. And, uh, you know, without them, 
we are just preaching to the converted without the men. We know it's like this. But uh, we need to pass the message and uh, to achieve them. So without them, simply won't succeed in enabling women to balance work with their family lives. We can succeed in ensuring our daughters believe in themselves and in ending violence against the women and girls. At the age of 19, having finished high school and getting ready to start the university in Rome, in Rome, I decided that I have to travel to Venezuela. So you imagine how happy were my parents. 19 years old, alone, I said, look, I have my passport, now I can do it. And my father was against this idea because, you know, uh, it's dangerous. Where are you going? So, in fact, it was my mother to negotiate. She understood why I wanted to do it. She negotiated with him, and I left. And I left, and I learned a lot. I went to Venezuela to work in a finca de arroz, where you see the life of people there, what it is about, what is poverty, what is, you know, the life for millions of people. And I realized that I wanted, to do, I wanted to do something. I wanted to be part of the solution. And I decided that I couldn't live without doing something useful for the others. So this trip has totally changed my life, completely. My father was a lawyer. He wanted me to be a lawyer. But in that, during that experience, I realized that my life should be something different. So after graduating, I won a, I won, I won a scholarship and joined, joined the United Nations. As it was said by Christine, I worked for the United Nations Agency 25 years. It's a time, it's a life, 25 years. And 15 of which I worked for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. I worked in many troubled areas. Troubled areas means the Balkans, means Iraq, means Sudan, means Afghanistan. And I worked in my country, Italy, in a tiny, small island called Lampedusa, where hundred thousands of refugees were landing, risking their lives and accepting the risk to die in the sea. So I have seen a lot of people in these years to perish because they wanted to live in peace and grow up their children in peace. And safety, it's not a prerogative of the Western people. It's a right for everybody. So we have to understand what's happening in the world. And you know, when I worked in these countries, uh, I also realized that women were the most, you know, affected by war. The women. Contemporary wars are very often against civilians. And women are the best target. But uh, I also realized they are also the most resilient in the society, those who can refuse violence and turn this into something positive. So I learned that giving food to women meant that the whole family was fed. Handing women cash grants ensured that the children went to school. And I learned that distributing seeds to women resulted in crops and food for the entire community. It is not the same when you give aid to men. I can assure you. When uh, we talk about uh, the feminine qualities uh, which help us to lead, we should therefore also bear in mind that women 
have other very important characteristics which enable societies to heal and to come together again. Just like uh, we should uh, also bear in mind that uh, we should be fighting for emancipation of all women, including those millions of women who have no rights. If we really want to have the same rights, we cannot forget those women who have no rights at all. Because if we do so, we won't reach the point of the same uh, level of uh, respect. And also, we should also keep in mind that if we can have our careers, it's because other women take care of our, of our children, clean our houses. Those women, very often, uh, they are migrants. They leave at, or, at home their children, and their children grow up uh, with other people. And their children call their mothers only when they need money. And those women become sort of bankomat, you know. And we can't forget also that those women lose their partners very often because their partners decide to have other lives. So all this should be very clear to us if we really want women empowerment. We can't focus only on ourselves. So let me return to my story. Almost uh, three years ago, I was uh, in Athens, the Greek capital, and I was on, on a mission for UNHCR. I was talking to doctors uh, in an NGO clinic when, uh, you know, it was telling me that more than 50% of the people looking for treatments were Greek people. Not anymore migrants, not anymore refugees uh, as before, but Greek, because Greek couldn't afford anymore to go to hospital and to buy medicines. We are speaking about uh, Greek, which is the heart of our civilization and democracy. So suddenly I heard uh, shouting and went out to see what happened and there were a bunch of uh, African young men. And one of these was uh, wounded and was crying, and was really crying. He was desperate. And the others, the others were angry with him and, uh, and told him to stop complaining and stop crying. You are black, they said. What do you expect? It's normal. It's normal to be beaten up. Don't complain. Stop crying. So, imagine. They said, it is normal. If you are black, it is normal. So, I was really shocked. I was shocked because uh, migrants thought uh, the racist violence was uh, inevitable. They have to accept it as a fait accompli. Then, uh, I, a few hours later, I went to my hotel room and I was writing a blog. I received uh, a telephone call. Of course, uh, I mean, I was quite, uh, you know, shocked, as I said. And uh, the person on the other side of the phone was uh, the leader of CEL. CEL is a left-wing Italian party. I know this person because um, I had the occasion to, to take part in a conference with him. But, you know, uh, maybe sometimes he called because there was an emergency, something bad with the refugees in his region. So basically he said, uh, look, we are preparing now to the, the upcoming elections, we are preparing the list, and we would like you to stand as a candidate. So it was a, a surprise for me. I was not looking for a job. My job really liked a lot. And so I was like, thank you very much. I appreciate, but give me the time to think about it. 
And then I thought, we are in the middle of a political crisis in Italy. People, you know, are far from politics. Things have to change. And I thought maybe it was arrived the moment to give something back to my country. The country where I was, uh, you know, which educated me and which gave me the values I believe in. So, basically, after a few weeks when I went back to Italy, I spoke with him and I accepted to leave the UN system after 25 years and to try to do my best in my country. So, there were two months of tough, very tough campaigning here and there with the rented cars, little money, no experience at all, having the chance to meet maybe 10 people, 15 people, and uh, it was not easy. A small party which couldn't give us uh, any support, basically. So it was uh, an adventure, I have to say, but very exciting adventure. So I was um, elected. I was elected. And uh, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I have to remind myself. <laughs> so, Cell was uh, the junior partner of the Democratic Party, and, uh, and there was a problem of seats. So basically, in, that, in these elections, uh, the second largest party was a new one, so-called Five Stars Movement which is uh, a movement uh, uh, new and based uh, on uh, an anti-establishment agenda. So then, of course, uh, because of this, uh, the winning coalition, which in any case uh, didn't have enough seats in the Senate, uh, wanted to, to, to prove, to also um, accept the challenge that uh, even the traditional parties could, uh, could change and could uh, promote new faces. So, on my second day as uh, an MP, believe it or not, uh, with no prior experience uh, of parliamentary work, I was chosen and elected uh, as uh, the coalition candidate, and uh, a few hours later, I was the president of the Italian Camera dei Deputati. My dear friends, I have to tell you, it has been a learning process, not easy, believe me, for good or for bad. And uh, though my life has changed in, in so many ways, uh, in fundamental ways, uh, starting from uh, freedom of movement, you know, now is limited by security concerns, also, I have to change many things, but nevertheless, everything can be done. And I think it's worthy. It's worthy to, to focus on, uh, on changing things. And uh, in my case, to make uh, the institution more open, the institution more closer to citizens, uh, more transparent, for me, the challenge is to make the institution more suited for, for our times. So I'm proud I have the chance uh, to do this exercise. And now, you know, changes are there. The Chamber of Deputies Secretary General, which is a very important, is the head of the administration, is now a woman. Now, for the first time, Imagine, you wonder. <laughs> Female MPs have now set up a new bipartisan women's group, the Women Caucus, whose first meeting was held when the President Bachelet of Chile, former head of UN Women, 
visited the chamber. The chamber now uses social media extensively. It's the first time. And uh, we also set up uh, a commission to elaborate uh, a document, a declaration in which uh, we fix fundamental rights uh, to be respected on the web. Because uh, I believe that the potential of these tools, of the web, of the internet, to transform the world, uh, it's uh, exceptional. It's uh, unbelievable, it's something extremely positive. And I believe the potential anche to, to promote gender equality is there. However, however, we need to ensure that our citizens, especially the youth who use the social media more than the adults, they combat something which is a threat, the online hate speech. We cannot accept online hate speech. We cannot assume it's part of the game. It is not, especially when it is directed against uh, the minorities, uh, against the most vulnerable, and against the women. We cannot accept this. And I believe... that also women participation in politics uh, is fundamental. If we really want, have to, you know, we want to build up a society which is uh, more equal. But uh, given the crisis of our political systems, uh, I think also that, uh, you know, we need uh, new faces, new women, with new skills, new competencies, because politics need this. And uh, in case of my country, in the last elections of 2013, the election when I was elected, female representation in the Italian parliament rose to 30%, while uh, the average is 22. So it's, uh, it's a good result. It is the highest proportion we have ever reached, even though it is not enough. It is not enough because if women are 50% of the population, they should have 50% of their MPs. That's, that's uh, something which makes sense. But I believe, you know, that quotas, quotas, uh, it's not something I'm fond of, but, but I think that in a world uh, or in a society like this one, we need quotas. Quota is uh, a necessary heavy evil. Without quotas, women do not have access uh, to the institutions. And once we can we achieve the level of having equal societies, we maybe stop having quotas. But for the time being, I think it is uh, it is necessary. I also have to say that in my country only 47% of women are employed, 47%. This is totally unacceptable and requires greater commitment on our side. You know that the IMF has repeatedly stressed that if more women work, the entire economy, and not only women benefit. So we have to make them understand that is this in the interest of the entire society that women work. And it is uh, much easier for women who are financially independent uh, to end abusive relationship. If women don't have this kind of uh, possibility, they don't have also the freedom to leave those places where there is violence. In my new life uh, as uh, a parliamentary speaker, I'm committed to raising awareness uh, about issues which I am passionate about. Fighting the gender equality is one of them, believe me. This is one of them. It's not always an easy task, even when, uh, even when the subject we tackle appear to be minor or uncontroversial. My native Italian is a, a heavy gender language when high status roles and professions uh, have uh, invariably been uh, masculine, even, uh, even when uh, 
those uh, feeling them have been women. So the role is always masculine, meaning female ministers, female, female lawyers are called by the male version of their roles. Il ministro, minister, it's Mr. Minister, not Lady Minister, l'avvocato, so the masculine way, while nurses, for example, have always been feminine, as have school teachers. So I have tried to change uh, this uh, mindset, as I believe that language codes reflect power structures. Uh, they do reflect power structures. In the beginning, I was uh, made fun of uh, because I insisted, I insisted on being called uh, Madam President. Is it strange? Am I Mr. President? But it was considered like, uh, how could she say that? This is unacceptable, Madam President. So, then I decided it was better to be ironic about it. So then when um, in the assembly somebody called me, still, Signor Presidente, Mr. President, I replied, thank you, Madam MP. And everybody's laughing. So let's be ironic about it. And the battle to combat gender stereotypes has also led me to tackle advertising and the sexy way women are portrayed in the media, at least in my country. I object to seeing ads where families are gathered at, at the dinner, at the dinner table, and the mother is the only person cooking or serving everyone else, the mother. Or where I see ads with semi-naked uh, young women used to sell uh, toothpaste or cars. Why? Where is the relation? Or where men drive a sports car in, uh, you know, empty landscapes while women crash their cars while parking. Why do I have to crash cars? I never crash cars parking. Why, I wonder, do companies not invest in, in smarter, more ironic campaigns instead of replicating stereotypes which are no longer suited to our times? Why? I strongly believe that companies can play a major role in moving society forward, both, both in the public image they project and in their workplace practices. So, you said, uh, you asked me to mention the issue I'm passionate. So because of my background, of course I have been uh, and continue to be passionate about the issue of migration in a globalized world, world as the economy grows or shrinks in different uh, places. People move. Is it, is it difficult to accept? I don't think so. Sometimes you have growth in a country and this is a pull factor. Some other times uh, the growth is another country and that is a pull factor. So since the economy grows and shrinks in different places, people move around. Their movement contributes to development, contributes to decision makers struggle to, you know, contributes to the income, to, to, to the development of these countries. But, but decision makers, they really don't have the facility on the struggle to manage migration and to see it as an opportunity. Even when uh, the data shows that we need migration for demographic reasons to ensure the sustainability of our economies, but also of our pension funds. So the economy says, 
we need it. But, but decision makers uh, really don't find a way to manage economic migration. And then we have forced migrants, including refugees, who are also on the move. They don't choose. They are forced. They would like to be at home. They don't have the privilege to do so. And, uh, and they are now also arriving in Europe in large numbers, crossing the sea. And this is not a new phenomenon. But now what is new is that they arrive on our land borders. So they have now finally turned the issue as a European issue. Before, it was considered an Italian program, problem, a Greek problem, a Maltese problem, not a European one. But now that they reach the heart of our continent, yes, this is becoming a European problem. For too many years, for too many years, Italy was alone on the front line dealing with the influx of both people and uh, also the many deaths, dealing with the many, too many deaths among the migrants and refugees trying to reach our shores. As a prominent public figure, I have been trying to counter claims that in a country of 60, 60 million, we are being invaded, invaded by just over 100,000 both people. Numbers are clear. Just like we cannot claim that Europe is, be, is being overwhelmed by refugees when Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey alone host 4 million refugees from Syria fleeing the war in their country. How can we ignore what these other countries are doing and they keep the border open? I also take a stand against racism and xenophobia, which uh, many, too many public figures in Italy engage in. I am convinced that we must stop tolerating intolerance. We have to say no to intolerance. Otherwise, we take a responsibility with our silence. We cannot afford to be silent anymore. My expertise on the subject has also led me to look at the refugees, at the refugee crisis unfolding in Europe as an opportunity, yes, as an opportunity. This may strike you as uh, strange, but however, it is evident, and I just mentioned that not single state, no single state can address the crisis alone. No one. In the planet, there are countries of origin, can transit countries and countries of destination. So all countries have uh, a relation with this uh, phenomenon. And I believe that the current moment offers us the chance to steer Europe toward a new phase. We need uh, a new Europe, a new one. We need uh, an EU 2.0. Mm? A 2.0 EU, like our children would say. A more united, stronger Europe, which is able to respond to its citizens' needs and also to act as a global player. We need to work towards the establishment of the United States of Europe. The United States of Europe. And finally, I'm proudly convinced that all women from all walks of life must act, all women must act to remove the obstacles which they have met over the course of their careers because of their gender. And in doing so, it is important not to delegate, not to delegate this task 
to others. So this is the only way we can achieve a better result. Our commitment, personal commitment, uh, to be engaged in this task. I hope that many of you are passionate about the things which uh, drive me to work long hours, travel extensively in Italy and abroad, and make sacrifices in my personal life. I hope that just like, uh, like I was inspired by many strong women, I have given you some food for thought. And I look forward to meet you again. Thank you.